Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Center for Chinese Studies at UH Manoa, I would like to welcome everyone to our spring 2023 CCS webinar series. And today's session featured as faculty roundtable and focusing on the question, how should Chinese and American universities cooperate in the new geopolitical context? My name is Yuming Bao, Ming Bao Yu from the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures, where I teach 20th century Chinese literature, film and culture. And I'm currently also serving as the CCS director and the organizer of this year's CCS webinar series with the kind assistance of the CCS Executive Committee and CCS Associate Director Ren Youmei, Dr. Cindy Ning. Please note that today's session is being recorded and the file will be uploaded to our CCS YouTube channel, where you will also find previously recorded CCS webinar sessions. Our full program flyer for this semester can be found on the CCS website and Instagram, and you can see the links to all three media platforms now in the chat forum. Today's session is kindly co-sponsored by the College of Education's Department of Educational Foundation here at UH Manoa, and we would like to thank and acknowledge them for their support. Before I introduce today's moderator, who in turn will introduce our three distinguished panelists, allow me to quickly go over some procedure reminders. Feel free to use the chat form for posing any technical or other queries but use the Q&A tool for posting comments and questions to our speakers, which will be answered during the Q&A session. We kindly ask that you please keep your comments concise and ask no more than two questions so that we can accommodate everyone and keep within the 30 minutes we have allocated to the Q&A session. We will try to take the questions in the order they have been submitted, but we might also group together or synthesize similar questions so that we save time and make room for other comments and queries. We further reserve the right to dismiss comments and questions that are not relevant or civil in tone. After today's session, you will receive a brief survey and we would greatly appreciate your constructive feedback. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the organizer and moderator of today's faculty roundtable, Cheng Baoyan, from the College of Education's Department of Educational Foundation, where she is a professor of comparative and international education with a special interest in Chinese education, international student mobility, equity issues in higher education, globalization and cultural issues in education, and liberal arts in education in the global context. So without further ado, let me turn over to Dr. Bao Yancheng. Thank you, Ming Bao. Uh, thank you all in the audience. We really appreciate that you take the time to join us today. What a great intellectual way to spend Friday afternoon, evening, or Saturday morning, uh, depending on where you are. We are great, greatly honored to have three panelists who are going to share their expertise on the topic of the cooperation between Chinese and American universities in a new geopolitical context. Our first speaker is Professor Dennis Simon, who is a clinical professor of global business and technology at the Kinnan Flankler Business School at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He recently left Duke University, where he served as the senior advisor to the President for China Affairs and executive director of the Center for Innovation Policy in the Duke Law School. From 2015 to 2020, Dr. Simon served as the executive vice chancellor of Duke Quinshan University, a Sino-US joint venture involving Duke University, Wuhan University, and the city of Quinshan. He also held a faculty appointment as professor of China business and technology and Duke's Fuquan School of Business. Prior to joining Duke, he served as the senior advisor to the president for China affairs at Arizona State University. And prior to that, he was vice provost for international strategic initiatives at Arizona State University. Along with having a distinguished academic affair, Dr. Simon has also served as the general manager of Anderson Consulting's China practice, now called Accenture, where his clients included many global Fortune 100 corporations. He later served as the funding president of Monitor Group China, 
where he led strategic consulting projects with both Asian and American firms. In 2006, he received the prestigious China National Friendship Award from the then Premier Wen Jiabao in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. Dr. Simon holds an MA in Asian Studies and a PhD in Political Science from UC Berkeley. He holds a BA in Asian Studies and Political Science from the State University from the State University of New York and New Paltz. Our second speaker is Professor Qiang Jia, who is an associate professor and the faculty of education, York University in Canada, where he served as the director of graduate program in education from 2017 to 2020. In 2021, he was appointed as a York University Provostial Fellow in, for the academic year 2023 and 2024. He will be the interim director of York Center for Asian Research. His research interests include Chinese and East Asian higher education, international academic relations, globalization and education, theories of organizational change, and the liberal arts education in China and elsewhere. He has had dozens of book chapters and publications in journals, including China Quarterly, Higher Education Compare, and, philosophy, and Educational Philosophy and Theory. His recent published books include a co-translated book entitled Universities as Engines of Economic Development, Make a Knowledge Exchange Work, which was published by the Higher Education Press this year, and a co-edited volume entitled International Status Anxiety and Higher Education, The Soviet Legacy in China and Russia, which was published by the Comparative Education Research Center and the University of Hong Kong and the Springer in 2018. Dr. Jia holds an MA in Comparative Education from the Institute of Education, University of London, and a PhD in Higher Education from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. Our third speaker is Professor Han Tianwu, who is a professor at the College of Education at Zhejiang University in Hangzhou. He also served as the deputy head of the Department of Educational Studies. His research focuses on comparative and international higher education, higher education internationalization and indigenization, and academic knowledge production. His research on these topics has appeared in journals, including Higher Education, Compare, a Journal of Comparative and International Education, and the Journal of Studies in International Education. Also in a book entitled, China's Outward Oriented Higher Education, A New Typology and Reflections from International Students, which was published by Springer in 2021. Dr. Wu earned his doctorate degree from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto and a master's degree in economics and education from Teachers College, Columbia University. He conducted postdoctoral research at the Institute of Higher Education at East China Normal University in Shanghai. Okay, so now uh, let's welcome Dr. Dennis Simon to uh, give his talk. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, this is a great program that uh, the center has put together. So I thank them very much. Um, this has been a busy week for US-China discussions. Um, I'm actually here in Washington, DC, where we just had the AIEA annual conference in which we had a big uh, panel on China in which there were about 150 people. Um, this morning, I gave some testimony before the Economic and Security Review Commission in which there were three panels uh, focused on Chinese uh, higher education. Uh, and then we have the program here at the University of Hawaii. So uh, clearly the issue of education and US-China education is a, is a very big topic topic for everyone. Um, in 1978-79 period, the United States and China signed two agreements as part of their normalization, uh, one on education cooperation and one on science and technology uh, cooperation. Uh, these two agreements in many ways formed the underpinning uh, for the normalization of relations, uh, and they held uh, in place for over three decades. In fact, uh, even in times of turbulence in the political relationship, the education and s and relationship seemed to provide the bedrock uh, for the relationship. Uh, 
At the time of normalization, uh, the United States uh, policy statement was very clear. Uh, a modernizing, stable China is good for China, good for the United States, and good for the world. And that uh, orientation, again, also held in place for over three decades, all the way through probably to the end of the Obama administration. And I think that that's, it's important to realize that that has been the premise until recently of, U of U.S. policy. And of course, the relationship in education and uh, science and technology has not been trouble free. There have been a number of issues that we've uh, had to confront, but nonetheless, um, uh, the two agreements have been uh, uh, solid elements in, in the bilateral relationship. If you look at the flow of students, you can see that the, it, the, the student numbers have grown uh, remarkably uh, over the over these three decades. Um, uh, in 2001, uh, 2002, uh, 63,000 Chinese students had come to the United States. Ten years later, the number increased three times to 194,000. And by 2019, the number increased again to 372,000. Um, and even though there's been a small decline over uh, this past uh, two years, uh, some of which is due to COVID, and of course, others are due to uh, perhaps uh, visa issues. Uh, the reality is that there's still some 290,000 students from China in the U.S., making China still the largest single source of international students in the United States. Um, now, we've also had some declines in other parts of the, the relationship. The number of students coming simply for OPT from China have declined uh, sharply, tw down 21.7%. Uh, and the numbers of students who came, uh, non-degree students, uh, who came as scholars, that also is down. Uh, a lot of these have to do uh, uh, with the legacy of the China Initiative, uh, which is, uh, even though it's been terminated, uh, it still formed a cloud that uh, affects some parts of the exchanges, particularly with respect to the exchange of, of scholars and collaborative research. We're also dealing with the effects of the uh, Trump uh, presidential proclamation 10043, um, which uh, set in place, you know, controls on students uh, who have any possible affiliation with the so-called seven sister uh, relation, uh, universities of national defense, that they are um, uh, prohibited from coming to the United States. And depending on whether that the uh, definition of association or affiliation is taken broadly or narrowly depends probably on the uh, state of the political relationship at any point in, in time. But uh, uh, 10043 still remains in place. The Obama administration did not change this. And this is something that we are uh, uh, dealing with. Um, the Chinese, uh, the future of Chinese students is uh, uh, is a big question for many, many U.S. universities because obviously uh, the numbers are so substantial, and in many communities in the United States, uh, they're not only there because of their academic contribution, which is, which is important, which is very important, but also they make a major financial contribution uh, to the locality that we should not uh, ignore. Um, in my panel on uh, Monday, Karen Fisher, who's a senior writer for the Chronicle, uh, suggested that the uh, recent decline is more significant than I've indicated, uh, that uh, there has been pent up demand that was unfilled uh, during the pandemics. And so a number of the students who chose to come um, uh, really reflects the, the uh, backlog of students that had been wanting to come, uh, but just simply couldn't do it because of the pandemic uh, situation. And um, uh, she points to a number of uh, features that have been important, and I think we we should not lose sight of those uh, uh, those features. Uh, obviously, the recent events at Michigan State University, where uh, of the five students, two of the students that were injured were Chinese, um, and that the overall situation of violence on U.S. campuses and violence in general in the United States has Chinese parents extremely worried and extremely concerned about the situation. 
situation uh, and uh, leaves them uh, perhaps doubting whether or not their children should go to the U.S., uh, for some, that means going to another country, Australia, UK, etc. And for others, it means perhaps looking at even the joint venture universities that have been established like Duke Quinchon or NYU Shanghai, Ningbo and Nottingham, uh, etc. So uh, this is something I'll get to later as we look at the, look into the future. Another problem we know facing uh, Chinese students these last two, three years has been the problem of racism and the rise in the number of anti-Chinese sentiments. Uh, this was not helped by the, the Trump administration in terms of the language they used surrounding the pandemic. Uh, I won't repeat the, those terms, but all of us know uh, simply that they were inappropriate and they created, uh, among some people, ill will towards Chinese that was just uh, uh, misdirected and uh, not uh, uh, not fair in, in most respects. Um, the third thing that happened, as I mentioned, the China Initiative, is that there's still these suspicions about, you know, what are these Chinese students all doing here in the United States? Um, and uh, there, there had been some worry about whether or not they were here for some nefarious purpose. Um, uh, but I think that the, the evidence has come to fore that this is just simply uh, 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 BS. Um, there was a recent report just issued by the National Academy of Sciences about Confucius institutes. I think it's a very important report that you read because the thing that's most important in that report is the clear, concise statement that Confucius Institutes have indicated no evidence whatsoever uh, from the public information that's available that they've been nests of spies or spy dens or anything of the sort. There's no indication that any of them have been used uh, for under the cover purposes. And so uh, it's a little bit late because many of them in the United States have been closed down. But nonetheless, I think the uh, Academy report should clear the air about what was going on, uh, particularly for universities that have had 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 very successful uh, experiences and uh, the ability to bring Chinese language uh, to local school districts, et cetera, was an important element uh, in the improvement of relations, I believe. Then there were other issues about the behavior of Chinese students on campus, some of the self-censorship that seems to have been going on, and the worry that some students were reporting on other students back to China and therefore curtailing some of their activities or willingness to make comments, etc. Um, you know, the cluster, the tendency of many Chinese students to cluster on campuses uh, and have a Chinese experience in America rather than having an, an American experience. Uh, this is a a shared problem uh, of the universities who may not have done enough to mainstream these students and give them more opportunities to interact with the broader community uh, of students across the university. And finally, there were the immigration issues. Many of the students who have come had hoped to have uh, OPTs and maybe even have employment opportunities through the H-1 visa uh, H-1B visa uh, mechanism, uh, and as that tightened up, uh, some of those opportunities uh, disappeared, uh, leaving them wonder, well, is it worthwhile to come to the, come to the United States? Um, I would I would argue that uh, one of the one of the bright spots out there so far have been the um, uh, emergence and the success of these joint venture universities. Uh, NYU Shanghai and uh, Duke Quinchan are joined by King University of New Jersey in Wenzhou. And uh, more recently, uh, Juilliard School of Music has been uh, established in Tianjin. Uh, and uh, those four represent four joint venture opportunities. There are several hundred other uh, joint degree programs that are that are in place. Uh, the earliest one uh, that uh, came about was the Johns Hopkins uh, SICE relationship with Nanjing University, which has trained many, many young people who have become part of the diplomatic service on both the Chinese sides and the U.S. sides, and they sometimes even get to sit across the table from one another in their careers. So these are all very, very important. And the joint venture universities provide a vehicle uh, for, in the case of DKU, liberal arts education um, to get established in China, and they serve as a knowledge transfer platform uh, for other uh, universities in China to come uh, to examine, to look, uh, to explore 
so that they can take back perhaps some things to their own campuses uh, and so that they can further introduce the thinking that surrounds uh, the concept of liberal arts education. This is not uh, unimportant. Of course, there are many challenges in operating these universities, uh, uh, cost obviously being one of them. Uh, also issues of academic freedom also have not gone away, even though the situation in general is pretty good because of the um, willingness of both the Chinese and the foreign side to, to come to an agreement about uh, what, can, what they can and cannot do. Uh, but uh, since they give uh, American degrees as part of their degree awarding and accreditation, um, they have to meet the standards of academic freedom and quality uh, if they're going to give these U.S. degrees. So uh, the, putting aside any political or ideological uh, orientation towards uh, uh, academic freedom, I think it's important to understand that accreditation requirements necessitate uh, equivalence in terms of the academic environment at the JV universities in China and their counterparts back in the United States. So where is this all headed? So first, I do believe that uh, while we may not see an increase in joint venture universities uh, very quickly, uh, uh, the ones that are in place seem to be doing well, and I think they do provide uh, a, an opportunity to prove the strength and value of the cooperation in, in the bilateral relationship. The second thing is that I think we have to take a close look at the bilateral agreement in education. That agreement, as I mentioned, was signed 78, 79 period. Uh, that's over 40 years ago. No one at the time that these agreements were signed could have imagined that we would reach 372,000 students from China in the U.S., of course, the situation on the U.S. side is somewhat more dismal. Right now, according to the U.S. Embassy, there are about 400 U.S. students going to China, and we have to find another vehicle uh, for them to go to China to get exposed to things Chinese uh, other than the traditional language courses and uh, uh, cultural courses that many students uh, uh, get involved with. We have to think of new kinds of platforms, new kinds of mechanisms, new kinds of models out there to do that. Um, we may need, in effect, to revise and ch and uh, establish a, uh, uh, we had 1.0, I think we need 2.0 in terms of education cooperation, a new agreement that reflects the larger scope, the different nature of the students, no longer gungfei or government funded, uh, the majority being undergraduates who are self-funded, that changes the nature of the, the game, and also the kind of issues that have emerged, um, because there are no longer just onesies and twosies coming to some locations and some universities. There are several hundreds of Chinese students, if not uh, in the thousands, so, so this is something. What I'm striving for, perhaps, is that maybe we need a new vision how to plant uh, the seeds of this new vision remains the big question because in the current environment, uh, we need to have the political will to say, look, um, exposure of our young people to one another when they're more impressionable and when they're more open-minded, uh, this is the time to get them to know one another, uh, uh, promote greater cross-cultural understanding, and we can provide a foundation so for that the next 40 years, hopefully we can have a sustainable agreement in place where the two sides can, can continue to cooperate in a productive way in both education and in science and technology. So I'm hopeful uh, that that uh, some good things lie ahead. The one bright spot is that in, in May of 2022, uh, Secretary of State Blinken made a speech at George Washington University in which he talked about the fact that Chinese students are indeed welcome in the United States, that the U.S. is lucky to have Chinese students, and that uh, he even went on to say that they help to enrich the communities, and they are also part of the effort to drive forward American innovation. So this is all good stuff, and I hope that not only was he sincere here, but we can operationalize that and make it into something that has some meaning on the ground in terms of the collaboration between the two countries. So with that, I'll stop here and uh, turn the floor over to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Simon. Okay, well, Professor Jia, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Professor Chen. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so now I'm going to share my PowerPoint.
All right, so in this um, 10 minutes also um, presentation, I try to provide a systemic approach to reimagining the China-US university relations down the road. Uh, we know this is a very uh, tricky moment. Um, so I try to, to provide um, a framework. Um, we can look at uh, such relationships. Um, this, oh, oops. For this um, um, systemic approach, um, I draw heavily on the four heuristic models uh, of global science provided by Professor um, um, Simon, uh, Simon Marginson, uh, who is now um, at the University of Oxford. Um, so he um, develops um, such a, a four uh, heuristic uh, narratives uh, explaining science and knowledge as a global space of activity and the perception. So among the four um, models, first is the um, as a globally bound and a collective network. The second is the global intellectual arena or market for the competing institutions or um, more specifically, competing for the prestige of the world-class universities. And the third as the center periphery hierarchy uh, in which the Euro-American uh, countries or systems dominate and form a global center zone. Lastly, as the arms race between the competing national governments and their national interests and national securities. So uh, with these four um, heuristic models, I try to fit the China-US university relations to each and every of the model, um, elaborate on the fit um, with the, and the data information um, from the literature or from the databases. Then I will highlight um, some changes and challenges asked in by the current geopolitical uh, tensions and, and also um, finally uh, determining the convergence or the divergence of the mutual interest in each of the area model. So the first model is to um, fit uh, the China-US university relations uh, in a global open network. Uh, this um, approach um, obviously aligned with the world culture uh, narrative. The second is to fit such relationship in global intellectual arena. Uh, this is aligned with the neoliberal narrative. And a third model is to fit such a relationship in the center periphery hierarchy. It is aligned with a world system narrative. And the final model is the arms race for national interest and security. And it is aligned with a realist uh, international relation theory. Um, which features the zero sum um, narrative. I hope I will have some time to um, elaborate on this um, theoretical significance uh, of each and every models, but um, I, I'm advised to uh, jump into the data um, first uh, because the data might be more interesting to the audience. Uh, if we have time, we'll go back to the theoretical significance of those models. So the first model is to fit the China-US uh, university relations in a global open network. So let's look at some data information um, we can grab um, and, and try to elaborate on such a fit. Uh, so here, the chart on the left side showing the top um, producing countries of science engineering papers. Their um, percentage of international collaboration or international co-authorship. And you can see, you know, this is the top 15 countries, right? If you do some math, you can find almost 40% of their papers coming out of international collaboration, international co-authorship. So that shows clearly how important, even how essential the international collaboration is nowadays. Uh, of course, this pattern applies to the US-China university relations. And if you look at this chart down, um, down here, the US uh, shares for more than 46% of China's international papers. And in the meantime, the China also uh, shares almost 23% of the US international uh, papers. So you can see how strong um, such uh, um, collaborations across the, the two countries and uh, the outcome uh, of such collaborations. Um, next slide, I will show you 
the, this is the uh, international uh, collaboration index uh, as measured uh, these countries, it's a major uh, countries, uh, their strengths of collaborating with the US. And you can see um, over the period of time from 1996 to 2020, China actually, actually gained most of such an index. So this is China, the first one, the far left is China. Yeah, if you look at the growth, China actually gained the most growth among all the countries working, collaborating with the US. That shows a strong tie uh, between the two sides. Of course, Chinese universities, American universities are heavily, deeply involved in such tie collaborations. So that's clearly pointing to a strong convergence of the mutual interest uh, across the two sides. But now with the current geopolitical tensions, we can see some challenges and changes. So here I want to cite a survey done by the Committee of 100 and in collaboration with the University of Arizona. There are a number of uh, such surveys. I'm, I'm using this because I'm most knowledgeable. I have some involvement in this. So this survey outcomes show um, the American professors of Chinese descent or Chinese ethnic professors, uh, they used to be the bulk of working with China in such an international collabor collaboration, international co-authorship. And now uh, they all have the fear. So they uh, indicate, uh, I mean, almost 41% indicate they would cut down the communication with collaborators in China. Uh, another 24% um, indicate they will not involve China in their future research projects. And finally, um, there's another 23%. Uh, they say, clearly, they will not work with the collaborators in China. And overwhelming majority, over 61%, citing the geopolitical reasons or the tensions are the reason behind this. So at the end of the day, the year 2021 witnessed a 20% drop in such international, uh, in such um, uh, Sino American co-authored the papers. The second uh, model um, is to look at um, the relationships in a global intellectual arena or the market. Um, I think the best way is to show uh, the uh, global university rankings. Uh, so here, um, this graphic shows the, uh, the Chinese universities making dramatic progress into the global university ranking league tables. So these are the Chinese universities met their way into the top 100. You know, 15 years ago, there was none such a Chinese universities in the top 100. And now there are almost 10. And you can see how much the progress they made over uh, one decade and a half or Two, two decades, right? If you take the Huazhong University of Science and Technology uh, in Wuhan, you know, it jumped by almost 400 spots and now included in the top 100. Um, of course, um, China's Peking University, Tsinghua University made huge progress as well. You know, for Peking University, it's over 200 spots, right? They're making a lot of progress. Uh, now they are among the top, top 100. In the meantime, this graphic shows the American universities included in the top uh, 100. They are more, way more than the Chinese counterparts, I think close to 40. But you can see their progress um, are not so impressive. You know, these are um, some, they, may, they do make progress. They do make progress, right? But relatively much smaller, yeah. Even for New York University, uh, which, um, jumped about 30 spots. For the rest, uh, more than half, uh, even they managed to stay in the top 100, they actually declined um, in terms of their ranking positions. But at the end of the day, uh, we are not just focused on the top 100. Uh, we look at, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I yes, think that's yes. something. Yeah, something wrong with my headphone. Um, um, we look at the um, entire um, global ranking um, legal tables. Uh, 
if you see that um, whole picture, yeah, you're going to find the American universities are still dominating the global rankings. Uh, so this is the most recent outcomes of the US News and the World Report, uh, best global universities ranking. And you can see among the almost 1,500 uh, universities included uh, in such a ranking scheme, the US uh, uh, makes the most and China follows. And so um, the US universities and US higher education system still um, dominating um, such global rankings. So now um, you can find, um, hang on, just give me a second. We can hear you well, Professor Zhang. Uh, no yeah, but but my headphone was not working. You you oh, you sorry. heard me from my from my computer microphone. Yeah, you know, analysis is back back to to normal. Sorry about that. So at that at um uh, uh, result, um, the American universities um, um make a big draw uh, for the Chinese students, and you can see how many Chinese students um and. Um, it went to the US uh, um, American universities uh, for the undergraduate level in some fields uh, like uh, mathematics and statistics. The Chinese students made 72% of all the international students in such fields, and even they constitute 11% of overall. Quite significant. Right? If you look at 11% of all such students in American universities in those fields, uh, quite significant. Uh, that's the same situation for uh, the graduate students, right? In some fields, mathematics, statistics, 64% uh, in, in international students are Chinese, right? And they make even higher percentage share of the overall such graduate students in those fields, 33%. If you look at some other fields, these are all STEM fields. Yeah, and we all understand how important such STEM fields. If we look at the graduate, sorry, doctoral students, those might be the most important knowledge workers uh, for the future. The decade from 20, 2010 to 2020 uh, witnessed uh, 70, almost 70% 70 increase of the Chinese visa students earning doctoral degrees in American universities, in absolute number, 70% increase. And their share of all the doctoral students um, in American universities also grew from 27% to 34%. So that decade, altogether, more than 57,000 Chinese visa students earned PhDs. Uh, from the American universities. And 92% of them were in the STEM fields and 80% of them remained in the US employment after their graduations. So you can imagine how much contributions um, the Chinese students made to American universities and also to the American labor force of the knowledge production. Um, and Dennis just mentioned uh, the the uh, the impact of the geopolitical tensions on Chinese students. And now you can see clearly a downturn. Um, and more details. And Dennis also indicated. Uh, now I can show some numbers. Um, by January 2020, uh, when the pandemic just started, the Chinese students constitute. Uh, more than 32% of all the international students in the US, they were the top um, international group. And by next, uh, uh, last month, last month, January this year, uh, their portion dropped to slightly over 24%. Still, uh, I mean, the, the change is minus, almost minus 29%. Um, uh, still, that they are the largest uh, the group, but the margin with the second largest 
uh, which is the Indian group, is very narrow now. Yeah, Indian group is now more than 23%. Uh, very soon, the, China, the size of Chinese students in the US will be overtaken by their Indian peers. Um, the third uh, model um, is to put uh, such a relationship through the center uh, periphery hierarchy. Uh, um, just now we, we mentioned uh, um, in this um, narrative, uh, the world is divided into two zones. One is the core zone dominated by uh, those developed countries and the US in particular. And other developing countries, including China, would be uh, on the periphery. But now um, China is opposed as major challenger uh, to this uh, narrative, uh, mostly uh, in terms of the uh, production of the science and uh, engineering papers. Uh, you can see uh, China's uh, uh, growth in such uh, papers, uh, which is very important, overtaking the US already. And you can see some. Uh, the numbers. Right, China is now taking the largest share. So China is uh, perceived as a, a major challenger for such a uh, narrative. Um, let me quote um, Simon Marginson. And he mentioned, and China's success is when still in, one, in a Western, not Chinese terms. So its rise has yet to modify the Anglo-American domination of the professional language, conventions, standards, and often the topics. So here I'm showing some outcomes on my own research, because uh, we compare the data um, from the top American universities. By that, I mean all the AAU members and the top Chinese universities, those double first class universities. And look at uh, uh, their publications and also the impact network from their publications. You can see those uh, red dots are the Chinese and the uh, blue, the light blue dots, the American. You can see all these major fields, natural science, economics, social science, applied science, health science. In most fields and the Chinese universities, even their top ones, they're still following the steps, following the lead of the American counterparts. The only one um, area uh, in which China Chinese universities performing quite well would be the science. But still, uh, they are uh, mostly at the edges of such impact network. And the final uh, model is to uh, put such a relationship through the arms race. Uh, so this is purely a, a zero sum uh, landscape, right? Um, it's, it's not really about global science, it's really about national science. So some data we can look at would be uh, China is now producing the largest cohort of STEM students. Uh, that is very important uh, for the national economic growth and national development. And China is now catching up the innovation quickly. So this is index of innovations. The US is still at the top system and China is catching up quickly, narrowing the gap. So that um, um, raised alarm to uh, the US. Uh, some people even compared that with the spawning moment uh, for the national interest uh, or national security of the US. So um, you, uh, 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 that could um, lead to some um, political and geopolitical uh, decisions as um, Dennis mentioned the China initiative. And such a model narrative often force people to take a side it's because it's about a zero sum uh, picture, right? So here I'm showing some backlash on the part of the US. Um, you can see um, the retaining scientists and mostly uh, the Chinese athletic. Uh, uh, you know, you see such a growth um, over the last decade uh, that could be attributed to the China's global talent schemes. But clearly there's a dramatic upturn since the uh, China initiative. Uh, so the year, the last year, uh, saw at least 14,000 US-based athletic Chinese scientists switch to uh, the Chinese affiliation. And that is uh, quite a significant 22% jump uh, from the previous year. I'm going to skip this, I'm aware of time. Uh, Professor Chen, how am I doing time? 
Act actually, uh, it'd be great if you could wrap up within a okay. couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I so here's a summary um, summary of the full um, heuristic uh, model. Right, the first model pointing to uh, convergence um, towards the collateral and the global gain. Uh, model two, um, that is, I would call that the partial convergence uh, leading to the U.S. gain. And model three, uh, that is partial divergence. I would say not yet leading towards China again. And finally, the, the model four, that is completely divergence, leading to somehow, um, quite interestingly, uh, the China again. But um, the question is how sustainable this is, how long it's going to last. Um, I do have some, um, um, again, um, theoretical model, uh, try to offer the solution or the resolution um, mostly um, about the uh, the um, factors at individual or the program level, how to maintain uh, their interactions or their connections. But I'm aware of time, so I would rather stop here. Uh, we could uh, discuss uh, that one if we have any questions about that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Zhao. Sorry, I had to cut you short. Hope, hopefully, during the Q&A session, if there are not many questions, maybe you can share that part with us again. Thank you. OK, now uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Han Tianwu to give his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Chen. So I would like to share my PowerPoint. OK. And. Wait a second. Okay, so, uh, so for today's topic, I would like to uh, talk about it from a kind of a unique perspective, from the perspective of China's academic narrative surrounding high ed or high ed internationalization in U.S. and beyond, which is um, somewhat somewhat different from what has been mentioned or discussed by our previous two panelists. And while uh, preparing my, sorry, okay, thank you. So while preparing my speech, I first ask this question, our the, the topic of our panel to the most popular AI, chat GPT, that how should Chinese and US universities cooperate in the new geopolitical context? And the answer provided by ChatGPT contains points such as um, developed academic change program, exchange program, and joint research projects and, and develop faculty exchange programs, something like that, and online cooperation and increasing government support, something like that. So I further asked about what are the ch challenges and risks in carrying out uh, the above cooperation? And the answer contains political and um, regulatory risks and inter, uh, intellectual property risks and cultural differences, language barriers, and technological risks, something like that, and academic freedom, something like that. And I further asked how Chinese universities should overcome these difficulties. And the answer provided by ChatGPT contains that points, uh, including uh, develop clear guidelines, agreements, and, and enhance English language. Uh, proficiency and build cultural awareness, awareness and strengthen techno technology transfer protocol and, and something like that, and promote academic freedom and transparency. And I find that my topic has not, be, has not been covered by the answers provided by Chat GTP while I asking these three questions. So um, I'm sure that I, at, at this point, I can hardly be replaced by the AI system. Uh, so for today's topic, and uh, actually, my sharing is mainly based on one of my uh, current research conducted uh, together with my co-author about uh, examining China's academic narratives surrounding high ed internationalization in foreign countries, especially the, the U.S. And the reason why I'm sharing um, um, this, this this research uh, while kind of for providing my uh, uh, reflections towards the main topics that due to the tradition of meritocracy, actually, after the China's reform and opening up, uh, China's domestic academic literature has become a reference for policy making, especially in the field of higher education. And also, uh, 
even in the 1980s, the early stage of China's reform and opening up, some of China's domestic researchers in higher education have discussed um, about the worldwide trend of high ed internationalization. And some of them focused on the uh, country specific situation in, in the 1990s. And in the first decade of the 21st century, some of China's uh, mainland China's uh, scholars in higher education started to discuss about the, the, the connection or the, the relationship between internationalization and indigenization of higher education, and which in, influenced the policy making in, in, in mainland China and also reflects the attitude of Chinese scholars, the academic community towards the foreign situations, especially towards um, the, the United States. So uh, my research actually, uh, it, it digs into the rhetoric of academic narratives and try to explore their influence towards um, the China's higher education practices. And maybe it can provide some inspirations for answering the major topic, the major question of our today's panel. And I won't go into every details, every detail of my research. If you are interested in my research, you can download this paper and read it. But I will mainly talk about its reflection or uh, inspirations towards our today's major topic. And so for this research, um, in terms of its analytical framework, it, it um, mainly uh, focus on several points while analyzing China's domestic academic narrative surrounding the high ed development and internationalization in US and other Western foreign Western countries. And so first it concentrates on uh, whether the high ed internationalization and development in foreign countries has been regarded as a historical process or a dynamic process rather than a, a current status or a goal uh, to be reached. And second, it concentrates on the focused uh, ge uh, geographical and locational dimensions of the target studies, target academic narratives. And then it focuses on that whether the, pr the practical significance of the research has been emphasized by the target research. And then it concentrates on that whether uh, the diffusion of innovation of high ed internationalization, rather than only the, the material process of high ed internationalization, such as the, the number of the mobility of people and programs, has been uh, concentrated by our uh, selected um, uh, academic narratives. And finally, about the disciplinary culture, the research examines um, the essence of the rhetoric from aspects such as the practical wisdom, the goodwill, and the virtue um, while analyzing the, the, the target academic narratives. And in terms of uh, the research, actually this, this table shows the analytical framework of, of this research and uh, several hundreds of articles have been searched um, and 33 target narratives have been selected from the search results due to their influence and their there's their concentrations actually. And most of them are about the situation, the high ed internationalization development in the US. And also some research concentrates on other regions and, and, and nation states, uh, such as um, some, some major developed countries and emerging economies uh, and developing countries such as India. And so for this research, um, for the research findings, First, most of the target studies um, focused on the current status of foreign situation rather than regarding the high ed internationalization and development as a dynamic process. So um, such a characteristic and, and China's um, higher education practices actually mutually influenced each other. Uh, since researchers regarded it, I mean, higher education internationalization as an index for higher education evaluation and uh, while becoming internationalized is increasingly seen as a goal to be achieved by policymakers and also some of the researchers. And, and, and second, in terms of the focused dimensions, um, the research finds that most of the target studies, most of the influential academic narratives in this field in, in mainland China, they regard, uh, they mainly focus on the kind of the macro level situation. They mainly used a macro level perspective while analyzing foreign situations. And uh, 
most of their research are mainly based on the secondhand macro level quantitative data and policy documents, I mean, national level or government policy documents retrieved from the internet. And this table shows the high frequency words among the target papers. And we can see that uh, most of them are related to the macro level perspective or the, the government uh, governmental macro level um, interventions towards higher education practices, especially higher internationalization, such as uh, keywords such as national and policy, since in China's context, policy usually means the national government policy and government, something like that, and plan, and yeah. And this figure uh, shows the co-occurrence relations among the high frequency words. And also many of the key words are related to a macro level or national level perspective, such as national or, or policy. And, and they, they kind of co-occurred with the, the, the crucial words such as internationalization, higher education, and education. I won't go to uh, the, the go into the details of the, the the figure and tables, but just want to share with you the main points of of my findings. And actually, um, mainland Chinese scholars have been paying attention to the macro level dimension only for a long time. And uh, actually, while while looking at the paper published in 1990s and early 2000, we also find that most of the keywords are related to the macro level perspective or the national level situations. And in terms of um, the analytical concerns on the diffusion of, of innovations, actually um, most of the target studies uh, focus on the kind of the material process of high ed internationalization in foreign countries and using data such as the, the number of um, the, the mobility of students and, 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 and scholars and programs, rather than focusing on 